Grazie. Grazie. Salutations. This is going to be an interesting video because I'm going to tie two things together that are rather abstract, but they do go together. And I think it's once again us becoming more knowledge and going further into a different type of a civilization. All right. This is incorporating. Um, okay. When I was um, this is this is about the assemb assemblage point and the Mako, black hole, Mako, magnetically eternally collapsing objects, as Rudy Shield calls them. Uh, he spent a lot of time working on black holes from the data from the observatories, years and years, like 40 years. So he has a whole nother theory on how black holes actually work based on what he's collected from the data. And it's not like the theories we hear, all right? One is that they're not infinite and number two is they do have hair, which is meaning there's a thing I'd always hear as a kid that black holes don't have hair, meaning they don't have a magnetic field around them. That's incorrect. Anyway, taking this and transferring this to a different area. Now, when I was younger, on into my you know, younger adult years, I didn't know what this was. I, I would always see when I see people by energy and see the energy fields of people, which go several feet outside of their body and seeing them as pure energy, and those of us that can really see, you know what I'm talking about. And But in the middle of this, this, what is often called the luminous cocoon, this field of energy that's way outside of the body, six, eight feet outside of the body of a person, it's often spherical shaped, or sometimes I would see it mushroom shaped. But always the bright, whatever color it was, and that you know, went through a point to where I thought maybe I wasn't really seeing psychically or seeing by energy because... I wasn't seeing the beautiful radio ray, rainbow colors on people like you see in the books. We all don't see like that. Some of us see the energy field of people. It's a white color. It can be a grayish color. It can be a golden color. Something similar to that. It's not quite like what you see in the chakras book, you know, the kundalini book. For some it might be, but for a lot you might see like me. But it made me underestimate. Oh, I'm not seeing right because I'm not seeing the colorful plates like in the books. But in reality, <laughs> in these energy fields, all right, of these people, no matter what color, I would see this black spot. And normally the black spot was in the same spot, around just on the side of the diaphragm, I would say, normally. On most people, always in the same place. But it was a big spot amongst this luminous cocoon. I was doing, and I didn't know what it was, you know, if it was an eye or, or what. And I didn't start putting a name to this until I was in high school and I read the entire... Uh, Carlos Castaneda edition, up to, at that point, I think he was up to The Art of Dreaming. So I read all those books, a couple times actually, because it was good information in them. Then I read the ladies that he worked with outside of that. So his whole body of work I checked out and I started looking into Toltec information as well. And they talk about the assemblage point. How the assemblage point is this black dot on the luminous cocoon, okay, which I had seen, and how actually the universal filaments, universal light goes through the entire cocoon, but it goes through the assemblage points, and the ones that go through assemblage point is what assembles the world around us. So that's why most people's in the same position, because I guess the general band 
around the mid the mid area of the of the, of the luminous cocoon is called the band of man, which means the ones that are they move that position. If you move the assemblage point anywhere anywhere on that uh, band of man, you assemble worlds that are quite similar to this one. So each time you move the assemblage assemblage point, different universal filaments flow through the assemblage point. You assemble a different world. So when you dream, sometimes the assemblage point goes way beyond moving beyond the regular band of man. So that's something, you know, to take, to take uh, notice of. So anyway, <clears throat> taking that and correlating this assemblage point to what Dr. Shields calls the Makos themselves and how they function, we're dealing with the same thing. What's very interesting about the Mako is the ways he described it. We'll give this man much props, all right? He spent hours and hours for a couple months. We talked hours, hours about it. He's got, he's not an experiencer or a contactee like me. He's strictly a hard scientist and comes from that hard data perspective. And that was able to correlate with my experiences, which he took an interest in some of them. And uh, it helped me verify some things through data and through mathematics, which I'm not a mathematician, but he's dealing with the math and helped expand my own horizons and parameters on some of this, all right? Anyway, the Miko being what they are is one is that they are um, not, okay, we're always told that like when I was a kid there was that movie, The Black Hole, do you remember that with the cool robots in it? But the, the thing is black holes always pull everything in, even light, nothing can escape it. That's what they always said, all right? But in reality, what you've got is things are being pulled in to around the aerosphere, around the, that quantum hologram rotating the same way a pool does, all right, Ro the rotation of a whirlpool, that the matter that comes in goes around that surface. And that starts creating also that, that, ho that quantum hologram. And there's something inside positron called positronium inside the black hole that stops it from being infinite. So it's not infinite. In fact, you've got some material that's being expelled at some points and you know that's coming from what would be called white holes which I believe is actually microbial dark matter a type of a bacterial things that's mixed with the Einstein Bose uh, condensates, condensates something that's mixed there that's being generated from this white hole on the other side of the Mako itself and my understanding is that is also the divine spark and the creative spark within there. So not just do you have on the outside of this, this black hole, you have the universe being wrapped around it time-wise as what we would call the Akashic Records. Those of you that are really into that, what are the Akashic Records, really the records of space and time? Just describe them. These black holes, these Makos, are the hard drives of the universe. So you've got, you've got actually that quantum hologram on the front, which is really, really, really heavy, okay? That's, that's, that's something as far as um, what actually the information in this world is. And taking this a step forward, these have been correlated that these Makos actually function the same as brain waves, different types of brain waves. But actually they're calling them, <coughs> excuse me, quantum, or, uh, quantum con conscious waves, conscious waves is what they've been calling them. But when you look at them, actually they're like the different types of brain, brain waves. And conscious waves are spiral. That's been proven, that's been shown throughout history here. That actually, and even if you look at the work of uh, Wilhelm Orgo, or Wilhelm Reich, and what he called Orgo, a lot of that had a spiral formation to those energies too. So check that out. That's something that everything here in this universe is based on the spin. Okay, everything is spherical and based on the spin in this universe. So that takes us from the DNA, that is spiral, all the way to the atom that's going around the electron, that's spiral. The galaxies are spiral. The planets are doing orbits that are spiral. So that's the thing of this universe, all right? Um, uh, anyway, so taking that and what these, these, these Makos would be, and now that we know that their brain waves or conscious waves, they function like that, it means they're accessible consciously. That's why the whole Akashic Records, why people can access that. You know, it makes me think of what Edgar Mitchell said when he was doing the barbecue effect in the, in the shuttle coming back, or in that uh, 
Pro, he said he looked out and he saw like all the so many stars twirling and he felt like one of them, I think if I'm quoting this right, one a star, each individual light was connected to a cell of his body or something like that. I mean, that's getting pretty close to that. That's heavy. So the speed of thought, they say, is estimated to go 100,000 times the speed of light. So if you're going to get to one of these Makos, or one of these places like my friend, uh, the insectoid Xandar told me, you know, uh, go uh, 800 million light years out, and those galaxies that are out there, that are near, if their, their, their Makos weren't initially part of the universe and were formed later, you've got like actually the same as Earth, you've got this, a layer of onion, like, like a layer, like an onion, these layers that are actually going around in time. So the closer you get to the middle, the more ancient you would have. The stuff on the outside would be more like what we're dealing with right now. That's fascinating when dealing with that <clears throat> and looking that when dealing with all these, what, trillions of galaxies, like the Milky Way, each one has a black hole in the middle. So does that mean that, so that is the way that actually the divine spark and the creator is communicating and giving energy to each galaxy. That's one of the ways. That's fascinating and that's heavy. So what's inside of the black hole is, is worthy, you know, and kind of what we're dealing with in terms of the quantum hologram of some civilizations that may not exist anymore but they can interact through that quantum hologram and our brain because it deals with the brain waves. This is serious. It's showing you that space is nothing like what we've been told. All right? It's not the same as the, as, as the Enterprise. That's why they can only go in one galaxy. They're not going, warp one is the speed of light. We're talking about 100,000 times the speed of light. The speed of thought is instantaneous. So that's how this is the level we need to get to. And before I shut this down, this takes us into the level of a type 4, type 5 civilizations that are used the fabric of space itself as their prime power source. These wormholes, these makos themselves as its, as its prime power source. That's heavy. You know what I mean? That's at what point they may not exist anymore, but they'll still exist within that quantum hologram, within that, that mako that does that. That's fascinating. Um, um, taking this one step forward, I shut this down, I'm sorry, this gets me a little excited. Um, tying this, they're also doing calculations that put these makos or these black holes attached to our individual cells. So when you're dealing with that, I'll put up that internal stargate chart that actually deals with the chakras and the different shapes um, that will allow uh, interdimensional transport. That's a very fascinating chart, right? But that takes us into that level of dealing with these makos that are attached to the individual molecule and also to what I believe uh, on a video over black extraterrestrials, melanin dominant extraterrestrials I did with Corey Good. Corey Good was talking about a race of melanin dominant extraterrestrials that can actually transport themselves without technology. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, taking this and one last thing, transferring this into um, what Corey Good talked about, the melanin dominant extraterrestrials, in a video we did over black extraterrestrials, melanin dominant extraterrestrials, he talked about a group that was able to use the black holes of their body to, of their mole each molecule, to actually do galactic transport. And therefore they never had technology, they didn't need technology or craft, and were inconquerable by most all races. So it's just another thing that takes us into this hyperdimensional type of a stargate like I'll post about, it's the same thing, it's all tied together. How these Mikos are not just in space, but they're conscious hard drives of the universe and how we have that inside of ourselves also. And this takes us to another level, and I think that's important, especially when understanding the different type of contact we've had. Especially mine, I'm dealing with beings from other universes in several cases that are dealing with different shapes. Some of them might be cubed instead of a uh, spin like this universe. Therefore, when they come here, they have these things that are like cubes on board the craft that they're dealing with like conscious waves from their universe trying to transfer it to this one. And the conscious waves would also be orgone energy. It's the same thing, spiral waves of energy. See, we would think these things are separate when they might not be. So anyway, um, thank you very much. Please subscribe. 
Please press the like button, uh, hit the bell if you're already subscribed so you know I put something new out. Please check me out on Patreon, there's a whole ton of work I've done over there that is not here on YouTube. I've had a lot of people say, oh, it's good to see you're still posting videos every now and again. I post videos every month in Patreon, quite a few of them. It's a different deal going on over there. So come check it out if you're interested. I uh, appreciate those people. Thank you very much. Keep it real and peace.